All right, welcome everybody. Uh, today we'll be talking about uh, trauma cases uh, and some of our experiences here in Dallas uh, with uh, CT imaging as well as uh, general trauma cases. So welcome everyone. I'm excited to be uh, doing it along with my partners uh, in the trauma group and, uh, and our general partners. So uh, introduce um, Ted Bellinger, who's uh, working with us in our trauma system. Uh, one of the other uh, partners, Kevin Ju, uh, had power outage, so he's going to be joining us uh, whenever he can. Uh, but uh, both Ted and Kevin are, are critical partners for, for myself uh, in running the Level 1 Trauma Center for, for our side, uh, for orthopedic side uh, in, uh, at Medical Center of Plano. So uh, I'll go ahead and start the, the talk. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so uh, starting with this. So again, what we wanted to do was give a synopsis of some of the interesting trauma cases where there, there's some learning potential and, and some of the things that we've learned uh, over the years. So the, the very first case uh, that we have uh, is, is a, unfortunately a very common scenario uh, we had a 45-year-old male who had fallen about 20 feet, um, was working uh, in a construction center, so uh, falling off, off of uh, scaffolding with injuries to the thoracic spine, uh, severe pain in the thoracic area with, uh, with a radiculopathy, you know, nuance of weakness in the left foot, and paresthesias. Um, no significant past medical history. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the patient does uh, drink excessive alcohol when he's not working. Uh, on his presentation, he had uh, a significantly weaker tibial anterior, but uh, his, his lower extremity function was grossly intact. He was able to elevate both of the lower extremities away uh, from the, the, the bed, so it was at least four out of five. Uh, he did have some limitation in splinting because of thoracic discomfort. Um, and he was able to urinate before they had inserted a Foley. And so, you know, when we look at this, they, the, you know, in our trauma center, uh, just like most centers, they, they do scanning CTs, skeletal surveys. And if we look at the axial imaging, uh, we see kind of a fairly typical pattern of a, of a burst type injury. And in this particular case, we could see that there was significant um, violation of the canal. And, you know, and not atypically, uh, you have the injury that in this particular case, L1, um, you can actually see that there's a, a, a lamina fracture at the, at the level above that. And in this particular case, there was also some concomitant injury in the proximal thoracic spine, which was not as evident in the, um, in the CT, but was in the MRI. And so when we, when we look at this, you can look at adjacent uh, associated injury. And then there's the, uh, the burst fracture, um, which is seen here. And you can see it is at the level of the spinal cord. And then there is some compression at the level of the spinal cord. And, you know, when we go through the algorithms for assessment of uh, injury and whether or not we treat them surgically or not. Uh, we do use some of the parameters and there's good literature from uh, Vaccaro recently uh, through the thoracolumbar injury, uh, where, you know, when we look at the alphabet soup, if you will, of, of the nature of injury, uh, it's a way to kind of structure it and have some framework of, of thinking about this to say which ones are we really operating on, which ones are not. Uh, and it was found that uh, with this classification, with the thoracolumbar injury classification severity score, when we really look at the morphology of the injury, the integrity of the posterior longitudinal ligament complex and the neurologic status, uh, there could be fairly reasonable um, uh, inter-observer uh, agreement uh, about which ones to operate and which ones are not uh, surgical. And certainly when we look at this, uh, just to kind of review this, uh, there's an assignment of, um, 
of a score of one for a compression injury, one for a burst injury, uh, translation or rotational three and distraction four, uh, and zero if the PLC is intact, uh, if it's suspect it's two and injured is three. And then obviously the neurologic involvement, um, zero if it's completely intact, uh, three if it's a cauda equina syndrome or an incomplete spinal cord injury. Um, you know, low scores suggest non-operative abrasible injury. And, uh, and what I would say is for the young surgeons, there's really great literature now that supports that, uh, you know, before we used to brace and now there's even some good literature to suggest that even non-bracing uh, may result in equivalent uh, function and outcome and, and radiographic parameters. Score of five or more suggests that surgical intervention may be considered. Um, and, and four was this kind of borderline. And it was, it's a fairly reproducible uh, assessment uh, where there is, uh, there's very good or good uh, agreement. So, you know, when, when one of the things that we looked at, at at the medical center is when you have these types of injuries, you know, when do you operate on them? Uh, do you operate on them right away? Uh, do you operate on them when, uh, if it's at 10 o'clock at night, next morning when you have time in your uh, surgical schedule? Um, there's not a lot of great literature uh, on the timing, surprisingly. Uh, there was this study that we found um, that specifically looked at thoracolumbar burst fractures, but really most of the history was really looking at cervical uh, spinal cord injury and assessing if, if there was improvement. And, and the cervical cord literature is more, um, more profound in saying that early intervention or less than 24 hours makes a significantly uh, improved outcome. And we've seen that borne out in our experience. Uh, but in the thoracolumbar burst fracture, when we looked at it, uh, and frankly, some of our experience when we did this for a long period of time and we followed and, and there were cohorts of individuals or surgeons taking the same call pool who uh, took longer, what we found is that, you know, there were shorter hospital stays and uh, complications, and that's borne out with some of the literature reviews as well. People generally do better if you treat them quicker. And, and then the other thing that happens is you can actually start all of the, the chemoprophylaxis and things like that in the, in the early setting if it's done right away. And then when you do surgery, you know, I think there's also some debate about, you know, how do you fix them? Do you, you know, um, and if you're going to do a posterior construct, which is a pretty accepted technique, um, you know, do you do uh, mixed uh, hybrid screws, meaning uh, polyaxial screws alone? You do a mixture of monoaxial screws. Uh, and I think there's, um, you know, and I can speak for my own experience uh, and, and, and I'll let my partner speak about how they do theirs. But, you know, what I've been trending towards is a better segmental fixation uh, above the fracture and below the fracture with monoaxial screws. So I found that is very helpful, one for reduction techniques. And it kind of also harkens back to the the origination of some of the old reduction techniques. And, you know, when you used to use shan spins and, and, and some of those techniques that are somewhat uh, forgotten and not known to the younger surgeons, but had tremendous potential for, uh, for reduction maneuvers. And so I think this allows for us to, to dabble a little bit in some of the better um, capabilities of having monoaxial screw fixation to get reduction and indirect reduction, which, you know, with better navigation and better imaging techniques may have more or greater relevance. So certainly I made the case that uh, you don't want to delay longer than 72 hours. Uh, and one of the reasons why we intervene early is because then we can operate on them early uh, and then they can start their uh, Lovenox early, frankly. Uh, and, 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 Chemoprophylaxis initiated within 48 hours of operative fixation really was not seen to increase the risk of bleeding, progression of neurologic injury, or postoperative complications. And I would say that that's, that's been our experience. So this is, this is just a view of, of an imaging platform that we use. Um, and this is an intraoperative CT scan. There's also an OARM available in our facility. 
Um, so we, we are proponents of imaging. Um, one of my partners does not use imaging, but is very, very talented at um, doing freehand techniques. So do, do what's going to be helpful for you in the middle of the evening or middle of the night is my, my takeaway from this. And one of the reasons, frankly, that we used this was because there was a sharp drop off in the skill set of the x-ray tech, uh, you know, after 3.30. So uh, when, we, when we started looking at this, uh, again, I use the navigation uh, really to look at the morphology. It's less about putting the screws, although it's, it's nice to be able to see where you're going to put screws in, uh, but it uh, does allow a good preoperative assessment of the nature of the injury. Um, and sometimes in, in certain cases, and particularly in like ankylosing spondylitis or cases where sometimes the plain fluoroscopy uh, may be hard to see small cracks or lesions in a thoracic spine and you're trying to count which one is the one that actually has a crack in the anterior part, the CT imaging is, is, is really a very good tool. And so in this particular case, in the case that we presented, uh, we scan and you can see on the actual view, here's a retropulse fragment. And, and so the, the marker is basically getting an assessment, one at the level of injury. Uh, if anything, it keeps us honest. So if you're gonna decompress, it really gives you a target of where the greatest level of compression is. And you can see that it's, it's on the upper limit. So if you just decompress right here, you're not going to get the fragment. So that, that's a kind of a rookie scenario of sometimes, you know, um, we're all guilty of it, that we may not decompress all the way up to maybe where the fracture fragment is the greatest compressive force. So we use this obviously to navigate the screws. One of the things that we use in particular is when we navigate we, we're not just trying to put screws into the bone. We, we wanna be able to put the screws into the bone in, if we're doing monoaxial screws that, are, um, that will give a reflection of how much correction we wanna get at the end. So I tend to put these screws in, in line with the end plates. So I have some reference points if we're trying to do some distraction. Um, so again, this one is two levels above. So I'm gonna put in a polyaxial screw, but if, if I'm doing it right at the, the level above the fracture, I'm gonna to try to line up in line so that way when we do any type of distractive force, if I use a, a particular contour on a rod, I can then direct the level of correction uh, or distraction. And so this, I, I really try to line up the end plates here because then if I, if I know that these screws are um, then extended, uh, I can get some extension moment in the fracture. And so this is, this is just a picture of, of the monoaxial screw of choice that you can pick. And we tend to uh, use a lot of power. I think we're getting older and that may be part of it. But the other part of it is, I think it's, if you know where things are, uh, it makes you, you know, gives you the capability of being efficient. And so this is just an intraoperative view of what our workflow is. And you can kind of see the, the, the fiducial um, seeing, and then there's gonna be a camera where we are looking in. And, and essentially the only thing I navigate is, is the, um, the navigated drill bit. Uh, and then once you have that initial pass, you can, you can do the rest of it uh, with the probe and you can see where you are. And so this is basically the, the workflow here and this is uh, Jacob, our fellow, uh, working and making sure that his side is, is being uh, appropriately cleaned off or uh, that, I think that's a Masonic. So this is the decompression part. But one of the things I noticed is if you look, and this is Jacob putting in the screw, notice the cheap stabilization device that we have to, to anchor and make sure that there is um, the drill guides staying on, on course. Um, I, you know, I found that cheaper technologies works just as good as some of the more expensive things that we can get. And that's a sponge stick. So this, this is a comparison where we can look at the pre and then the post. And one of the things that we can see is, you know, it kind of, it, it'll keep us honest. So if you look at this, this is the pre, this is the post. 
and then it's certainly better, but there is a little bit of a step off. I, I think if you look, assess, there is this Boeing that even though we've corrected the height, there is a, um, and the antral thesis is improved, there is this component of, of still persistent Boeing. And, and that sometimes the question is, you know, do you, do you decompress or not? And, and, and in this particular case, um, we have the benefit of neuromonitoring and he was intact in, in the sense that when they were able to monitor it, they did have some um, variance in how the side that he had the drop foot was still weaker relative. So it, there was some asymmetry. And because of that, we, we elected to, to decompress him in that site. But you can assess, here's another view, and you can see the immediate post uh, reduction. So in some of our older patients, uh, and, and based on some of the morphology, sometimes we can't get it all the way back. In some cases, we get it perfectly reduced. In this case, it was not. So we, we proceeded with an open laminectomy. Um, you know, on the initial MRI, there was a, a dorsal hematoma, so we were able to, to decompress that. But you could make the argument, honestly, uh, if they're intact, perhaps just to leave it. And there is some recent literature um, that was published about indirect reduction uh, that, that supports that. And so this is the standing film, and we get an EOS film to kind of look at the global alignment uh, post and, and obviously he's standing and walking and, and he's improving and his neurologic function even in the, in the drop foot was improving in the immediate post-operative period. So taking that concept of the first one, I, 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 I did this case because this would kind of eliminate, this would kind of demonstrate some of the, the things you can actually do. So in this particular case, the biology is very different. So instead of a 45 year old who likes to drink a lot, now you have a 19 year old female who is the captain of a swim team in high school, who was unfortunately involved in an MVA rollover in the tollway, which is a, a large and busy tollway and presented to um, a sister hospital and was then transferred to our facility with really intense lower back pain, paresthesias and severe pains in the lower extremities. Uh, and on exam, she had fairly intense paresthesias, not true neurologic um, deficit because she was able to move her legs, but severe pains in the right more than the left leg with altered sensation. And so in this particular case, now you have, again, a burst fracture with a significant retropulse fragment. And, and so, you know, in this particular case, it's an unstable burst and, and has all of the elements of a three column injury. It has a pedicle fracture. You have this tooth of bone that's, you know, protrudent and creating a significant compressive component to the neural structures and you have a lamina fracture. But the, 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 the difference in this particular case, it's a very young patient who's very active and has a good muscle tone and great bone. So in, if we were to look at this in this particular case, we, we like the concept of using monoaxial screws. Uh, we like the concept of assessment of reduction. Uh, and, you know, in a 19 year old, uh, if you can avoid a longer fusion, we worry about some of the complications of junctional breakdown and wear and tear over the course of five years, 10 years, 20 years, right? 30 years, 40 years now. Um, or more. And so in this particular case, the worry is, can we do a short segment fusion, incorporate the index vertebra, um, and then still have the ability if we, if we needed to do more. So, uh, and in this particular case, we instrumented, and post-reduction, you can see that the lamina is reduced. There's the lamina fracture piece reduced. But if you look, there's still a persistent step off after the initial reduction. Now, granted, a couple of things that we do is when we do the index screw, we make it a little bit more prominent. So it does displace the fractured vertebra more ventrally. So the actual displacement, especially if you have a laminectomy, that level of retropulsion becomes less prominent. 
And so when you look at this, this is a this is her standing. And then when you look at this, you can see a very complex burst fracture with a very short segment frac um, construct with monoaxial screws. And this is what I mean by the concept of using a very prominent uh, index screw because it really does force the, this fractured vertebra ventrally. You haven't burned any bridges in the sense that if you needed to change or convert this into a short segment corpectomy, you have a window. You have a window to do a transoas approach. You have a window to do an anterior approach. I just worry about it because, you know, in a young patient, it's not without complication or morbidity. And in this particular case, we watched her very closely and we were, I'm thankful to report, we really didn't have to do anything with her. Uh, she healed well. She's now a freshman. She went, graduated high school, is now a freshman at A&M does daily spin class with very minimal complications and no residual neurologic complications. So, you know, when we look at CT imaging techniques, uh, I, I think it's important and it's going to be more, um, some form of imaging modality is going to be more critical for intraoperative decision making. And, and certainly I think we're kind of at the cusp of assessments intraoperatively for whether or not you need to do a decompression. And certainly there's lots of great reports of, of great and workable techniques for trans approaches and corpectomies, which may minimize some of the morbidity uh, associated. But even in these uh, described reports, if you look at the complication rates, it's not negligible. Uh, and about a quarter of these patients do have some degree of complication with the level of reoperation rate. Uh, we, we see a fair amount of these types of burst fractures, uh, and, and I use the slide of a patient that I had with a laminar fracture just to, as a warning to, to make sure that you look for, for these types of injuries um, because they're very, you know, there's a high incidence of association with durotomies or uh, traumatic dural tears. And, and actually how you manage this uh, how you address it is also important because a lot of times in this particular case, for example, the, the neural elements were completely stuck through the whole segment of bone and just, you know, trying to remove it without creating more trauma was one part of it. Uh, and then getting a good solid repair was the other. So when we, when we do, when we do decompressions for these types of cases, we try very hard, one, to assess and make sure that um, we're not creating more harm. We, we tend to use, or in my practice, um, we've stolen a page book out of the neurosurgeons and we steal some of their instruments. So now they're part of our sets. One of them is the Roten, which is a small pen field. It's a very light pen field. And there's a whole set of them that allows you to have very good and delicate manipulation. So if you're trying to move nerves around, it, it really allows you a level of comfort uh, and you can move it around like chopsticks, but they're not as heavy as a regular pen field. We, we tend to use the microscope very generously whenever there's neurologic involvement. Um, I use loops. Um, I have partners who don't, and, and they are very good at it. Uh, I, I use, my preference would be to use a Gore-Tex uh, as a stitch if we have to repair dural tears, and we are fairly liberal with use of sealants. Uh, as a augmentation, even if we get a pretty good tight repair, because oftentimes we, we just want these patients to recover well. We don't want them to bounce back at all or have a setback because they're already having a high level of injury. And um, you, you just don't want to have them revisit the OR if you can avoid it. So uh, the other case I would talk about is a is a 39 year old who now on this case is is a is a cervical injury. Uh, is an elementary school teacher, um, I think convinced his wife that, uh, you know, only lives a mile away, he's going to drive the motorcycle very carefully. Um, and since it was only a mile away, I think that's the reason why his wife let him drive a motorcycle, but somehow he got up to 90 miles an hour. And, and the police officer shared with me the video cam where he's seen tumbling and they recorded exactly 474 feet of him going down the road. And, and so he presented with severe paresthesias in the arms, pain in the neck and shoulder, heaviness in the lower extremities, 
But again, he was able to breathe on his own. Um, he was able to move grossly his upper and lower extremities. And um, after the initial CT scan, he did get an MRI, which shows this obvious extension type injury in the cervical spine with a three column type injury, but remarkably um, very low signal change, uh, if any, uh, at the cord level. And you can see on a CT, he has, at least on one side, a complete displacement and dislocation. So in these types of injuries, he also had a durotomy. Uh, he had sharp, sharp pieces of bone um, creating a, a kind of a lesion in the thecal sac. Uh, and, and these can be complicated when you're repairing them. But one of the things I wanted to point out is, um, and, and just to be complete, he had associated scapular fracture, but otherwise remarkably free of long bone fractures. So, you know, when we look at the algorithm for treatment for some of these patients, um, we, we get a CT scan. Uh, he was, I think his injury was around 3.30 in the afternoon. He was, uh, he was literally in the operating room within about four hours because uh, after the CT, he went to the MRI and he went to the holding area immediately after the MRI. So some of the, the more complicated disruptions, we, we tend to have a preference towards posterior approaches. I know my partner, Dr. Ballinger, um, prefers that. I think, uh, believes that it's, it's superior because of some of the prevention of airway issues. Um, we, we, we tend to use the Mayfield, or at least in my practice, I use the Mayfield, even if I'm doing an anterior approach, if I need to do a posterior, I don't have to switch it out. Uh, and it gives me a level of support on the head if I need to do a reduction. So sometimes if, if we've had cases where there's complete cervical fracture dislocation uh, with an incomplete injury and we can use the Mayfield to, uh, if, if we can get a closed reduction, but in the operating room, so we can reassess that. And then we can do a, you know, if we need to do an anterior one level and then flip to the posterior, we can stabilize it with a short construct. Um, or if you want to do the posterior, you, you're reduced and you can flip. So again, in this particular case, in this particular case with the, with the motorcycle injury, um, you know, sometimes the facet disruptions pose significant challenges for instrumentation, such as the traditional lateral mass screw fixation. And, and one of the things that I've seen, and I can just say anecdotally uh, over the years, is that if, if someone's not comfortable with this, the, the theory is go long and strong. And, and so you have these ridiculously long constructs for young people from C2 to T2 for what could be treated with a more focal treatment. Um, you know, there's, there are reports uh, of some of the options for doing pedicle screws in the face of trauma. And, and, and there are obviously successful case reports of using cervical pedicle screws. In this particular case, they use it for C7, which we, we do very routinely. And I think they use lateral mass for the proximal levels. But, you know, there are very good techniques for putting screws in small spaces. And over the years, the things that we've uh, done that, that are particularly helpful is, you know, creating situations where things don't slide or move. And so we tend to use, uh, in my practice, I use a diamond bit drill with a two millimeter drill and you create a starting divot. Uh, even if you're using a navigated guide, because if you can't, if it doesn't skive, if you have a pothole to, to stick the drill in, things don't move. So even if you have a very low margin for error, if, you, if you've created a starting pilot, um, things don't really move. And so that allows you then to be much more efficient with using navigated drill guides. Um, and then what, what I've found over, over time as I've used more and more power is we tend to actually do line to line tapping. So sometimes, especially the synthy screws are fairly blunt. And so sometimes uh, you'll, do, um, you'll do a starting tap and then I'll dial up to the level of the actual screw size which is particularly helpful in, in cervical, if you're trying to do pedicle screws, because the, the, it's such a narrow margin or window to, to put, and there's a, such a cortical window that you can skive. And so you actually have to use power techniques, I believe. 
Um, if you're doing other techniques, um, you know, for years and years, we used to use a hand drill or a blunted, blunted tap um, after you do the diamond uh, divot. And that's usually pretty good to keep you in bone. So in this particular case, we used cervical pedicle screws for a short construct. Uh, we decompressed him. He had essentially created his own laminectomy. We repaired the dura. We sealed it, essentially. Um, we, I don't think in this particular case we found one open spot that I could throw a stitch in. Um, and then we let him heal. Uh, so we, we put a subfascial drain. We made the incision. We allowed his posterior incision to heal. Um, and we did a tight closure and we, we use a barb type suture for fascial closure and nylons for skin. Once he was done, then we, we did an anterior buttress. Um, I think his overall alignment was better in the post-op um, than this was the immediate post-op. He was able to extend a little bit better. So in this particular case, he was very lucky. He, uh, he had no neurologic deficit. He had minimal complaints, which is, which is great, even though, uh, and even with the scapula fracture, remarkably, he was able to, within about six to eight weeks, he had healed it um, very well. Uh, I don't think his wife is allowing him to ride the motorcycle anymore, though. So again, pedicle screws in the cervical spine, uh, it, you know, compared to loud mass screws, uh, Ladd and company really did support that. It's just in a, in a biomechanical study. It's really a, a lot of pull out, pull out strength, uh, much improved compared to the loud mass. So, you know, looking at our summary of concepts over the years and over the last 10 years, um, we, we've tended to go to larger fixation or screws. I tend to do line to line. Um, and we tend to have a preference for doing shorter segments of fusion when possible. Um, and I remember when we started, we used to do like three above sometimes and, and two below. And, and then it's kind of gone to uh, maybe two above and two below. And then now we try to... If it's possible or feasible, as long as we still meet our criteria for making sure we have adequate fixation, adequate decompression. So we don't want to lose sight of the general concepts of trauma. Um, I think the, the, the concept of being able to do indirect reduction techniques whenever possible and restoration of canal is certainly uh, thrilling. Um, we monitor our case, so we have a pretty good assessment. And we've had young kids that had cord level injuries that we were able to get monitoring in the lower extremities with indirect. And so uh, we've tended to do indirect uh, and do shorter constructs. One of the key, key mainstays is do early intervention. Obviously it's, a set, it's assuming that your team is gonna be safe at 10 o'clock at night. Um, early intervention is the key uh, for diminished stay and early VTE prophylaxis. Um, and, and certainly, the, just to reinforce, the, the navigation piece has changed some of our capabilities. So even pedicles that are splayed, we'll sometimes we'll do an open fixation of that pedicle to the vertebra. Um, so we're able to get better fixation in the index levels. Uh, we're, you know, I tend to have more of a reliance on monoaxial screws whenever possible around the index fracture. Um, and, and, and we use certain neurosurgical techniques to help protect the neural elements. Uh, and we, we tend to favor early reductions uh, and doing it intraoperatively. So that way um, the patient is uh, relaxed. Uh, we're not compromising their breathing uh, during some of these maneuvers. And, and we're tending to do less fusion levels. And certainly when we look at um, you know, corollaries about with other practice patterns or in just even our own practice over the years, we, we, we're now fusing less levels. So, all right, Jacob, I'll pass it off. Hey Raj, just a question. Did I, did I blink and miss a slide? Did you just do that guy posteriorly, the last uh, motorcycle guy? Uh, oh, you missed a slide. I, I, did, okay. I did an ACDF. I, I, okay, I great. Stabilized it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I knew that you, were, you, you thought that was, it was exactly the appropriate thing because he, was, he would fall, fall forward. Yeah. Then. Yeah, and his, and his disc was already disrupted, so there's no That's reason right. to try to save it. Yeah, he did remarkably well after. It felt a lot better, actually. So he had quite a bit of posterior neck pain until I did the ACDF, and after the ACDF, it was a light switch. He had zero pain. Great. That was a great save, Raj. Nice case. Do you think, 
Uh, do you think, Raj, for a minute, we sh there were one or two questions in the messaging. Maybe it'd be good to address those conversations right away while everything is still fresh. One of them was uh, uh, quickly was just a question about timing of surgery for that thoracolumbar first fracture case. And I think you addressed that really well, uh, but maybe just to sort of underline it. You know, generally speaking, we think of faster is better. Uh, but I think an important thing for spine surgeons to understand for sure is that it isn't only about the neurological consideration. We are, you really have to understand the totality of the injuries that the trauma patient has. And, and one of the cases that Jacob will show of mine, uh, we did that in less than 12 hours from presentation for the same reasons, not because it made any difference to the spinal cord, it actually would make no difference in, in our example. Uh, the, the issue is that the patient also had a terrible chest injury and a scapular fracture and multiple thoracic fractures. So uh, moving quickly is more about protecting their lungs and getting them on their Lovenox and mobilizing them and helping them with all of their other critical care concerns. So we, we feel like the default answer is for an isolated thoracic injury, not as compulsive, uh, but if they have a concomitant chest injury in a thoracolumbar fracture, that is less than 24 hours, almost at all cost, uh, unless something else that's a priority is getting in your way. So I hope that kind of addresses that. Yeah, absolutely. Because there, there is this window of opportunity um, before they, they crap out and their, and their lungs go to crap. And so the worst, the worst thing that you could do in that situation is delay so long that then they get pulmonary edema and white out, and then you can't touch them for another week and a half until they recover from that. And they're now in a life threatening situation. And then uh, they get a DVT. We have all made this mistake at some point in our careers. Move quick on those ones with a chest injury. So if a fellow calls me and says, Hey, I got a T12 burst with minor neurologic deficit, it looks surgical. When do you want to do it? I usually don't answer them. I say, you haven't told me enough information yet. I need to know what, what's the rest of the story, you know? So um, the other question or other comments that one uh, party uh, observing in, injected into the messaging was about the, the other case about uh, your short segment fixation for the complicated L3 fracture and the question of, uh, surrounded basically instrumenting the injured or index level. I routinely put screws in that fractured uh, vertebral body level, but I agree with the general notion that if you have any thought in your mind that you may need to go back and do a corpectomy, which actually is extraordinarily rare in my hands, but if that is your concern, then your solution is just use really short screws. The, if you think about it, the screw is really only getting fixation in the pedicle in these really bad comminuted burst fractures. Lengthening the screw and putting it in that comminuted bone is probably not providing any additional value anyway. Uh, so I almost always will put in, let's say, 40s and 45s above and below the fracture, and then it's like a 25 in the fractured segment. Uh, if you end up doing a corpectomy, even if you do have screws like that in there, you're, you should be doing your corpectomy where the spinal canal is, not where the pedicles are. Uh, right. so yeah, two unless you put in a full length screw, it shouldn't be an obstacle for you in that situation. Right. That's right. But it's really valuable to have that screw, especially if you're doing a short segment fixation plan, because you otherwise you only have two levels of screws. And this is 50% more if you get a third level in. Probably less important if you're going kind of two up, two down, or three up, two down, or some other situation. And I use that screw just like you you described where... I put all the screws in and then the cascade of the screw heads is deep fractured level is a little more prominent and then deep. And then I put in a straight rod and that creates a lordotic reduction moment. You do have to be a little careful with the hat because you can push the lamina and the pedicles anteriorly and create more canal narrowing. I have one time done that where somebody developed spinal cord signal monitoring changes as a result of that maneuver and I just reversed it and everything turned out okay but that was a little bit dicey. But I've also done it a thousand other times and, and not had any negative consequences. And, it, and when we're doing the indirect reduction strategy for people that haven't done that kind of thing in recent years, because we're, we're doing other things, 
Um, how you do that really matters. The, the key, if you have a terrible burst in reducing it to try to get indirect decompression, reverse the kyphosis. So somehow get lordosis to happen, get rid of the kyphosis, and then apply distraction in that sequence. What you don't want to do is distract it while it's still in kyphosis. If you do that, that, that is how you create increased spinal cord compression and neurologic deficit. So as long as you do that in the right order, uh, distraction is actually an important part of the picture when you're doing these uh, with, without doing a direct decompression. Last comment, if I am doing a direct decompression and I'm doing a laminectomy, I'm used to doing pedicle subtraction osteotomies. It is not much different to reach around to the front and directly push on and reduce those fragments from the back. And I would say that that's probably the number one reason why I'd seldom ever have to do a corpectomy secondarily, no matter how bad the fracture is, because I'm reducing that retropulse fragment with my instrument in my hand. And you can, you can always get to it. Yeah. The, the, the one comment I would say is in, in the, in the lower lumbar or, uh, you know, below cord level, a lot easier to do it at the cord level. Um, again, you know, the worry is that already pretty traumatized spinal cord. And, and, and so I, I worry about some of the manipulation. So I really try um, to avoid putting a bunch of stuff in there if I can. Fair enough. All right. I think we answered the two questions and comments. Uh, take it away, Jacob. Actually, Ted, there was one more comment. Oh, it was about it? the cervical one. The question was, uh, was it safer? Why not start on the that C spine? Uh, why not start anterior rather than do posterior first, Raj? Yeah. So I mean, you know, in this particular case, we did it posterior because it was really very unstable. Um, uh, I, I think there is. Uh, in some of these cases where it's hard to get reductions, I have more capabilities um, for posterior vectors with instrumentation uh, than with the anterior. And I think that's probably the reason why I chose to do the posterior. Ted, you want to add on that? It's probably ultimately reasonable to do either way, but I would say an advantage in the back is that you can directly visualize your reduction a little more easily. You're putting a facet back on a facet and making interspinous uh, relationship normal again, and, and then you're usually really in the ballpark, whereas in the front, you really, all you can see is the disc and that's it. The rest would be with fluoro. It's kind of yeah. second uh, way of assessing your reduction, I'd say. Yeah, that particular case was really grossly unstable, and and I and I worried about uh, doing it anterior and and having the plate not have enough fixation, <laughs> and and have the thing fall apart before I could even flip them. <laughs> yeah, the other maybe the other argument is there's a chance that you could have gotten away with posterior only surgery. There is no scenario where I would expect you to be at with only anterior surgery. So right. you you go posterior and and maybe sometimes you you're done. This case no, but uh, uh, maybe sometimes you would. So all right, now Jacob, you're up. Right, well, thanks uh, Seattle for this opportunity and Texas back for really everything all year for these opportunities. Another thing I'll add to that burst short pedicle screw uh, fragment is making sure that screw is short enough so it doesn't lock that distal piece in and possibly block any type of reduction that you might get. That's one thing I learned too uh, recently. Um, <clears throat> here I have a case of a 51-year-old male restrained driver uh, sustained a automobile accident around 7 p.m. where he self-extricated um, and was transferred to a level two facility for then he was then transferred to us at a level one facility around 11 p.m. So all within four hours. No past medical or past surgical history, alcohol or illicits. Um, on physical exam, his right upper extremity uh, was motor intact. His left upper extremity, uh, his hand essentially had no function. Minimal two out of five in the wrist flexion extension, weakness in the triceps as well. Um, some bicep uh, lack of movement as well as deltoid with a decreased sensation globally in that uh, left upper and the left lower limb also um, had significant uh, weakness in the foot as well as some sensation uh, issues. And here on the imaging that he arrived with, he obviously has a 5-6 fracture dislocation of the left side of the superior articulating facet of C6 um, with it kind of locked in there and the perched 
facets of uh, C5, C6 on the right. He has significant anterior listhesis of the five on six body and in the axial views uh, during residency, I was always taught to look for the hamburgers and here on the, six, the C4, five, you can see the articulating facets, whereas at the level of the five, six, you do not and you see that locked in fragment. So here we have the uh, MRI imaging, which we were just looking to see if there's any extruded disc posteriorly, which there was not, but it doesn't tell us anything except for, if you look on the axials here, you can on the C4, five level, you can actually see a blush um, of the vertebral artery. And afterwards, uh, preoperatively, he was taken for a CT angiogram, as well as an MRI of the brain where he was found to have a vertebral artery dissection at the C3 um, to six levels. So before we even go to the operating room, he, he from his accident to about the time he was transferred to our facility was about four hours and in the operating room by 1230. So the discussion is kind of which way and how to approach this injury, um, whether it be posterior or combined anterior posterior, actually in Asia, there's uh, quite a bit of literature of anterior alone for these type of um, procedures. There's also a question of, you know, would you consider steroids in someone who's younger, like 51 years old, without any uh, lung issues, head issues, or diabetes, and if he's at high risk for any of those comorbidities. So I think those are things to consider. So our plan was uh, use a Mayfield clamp and a posterior open reduction of the five, six joints with uh, fusion posteriorly. And here, as you notice, just with the application of the Mayfield clamp, and then placing uh, in the prone position, he actually reduces a fair amount. And, and here, given the amount of reduction, it was after we opened it, we could tell that the right side, the facet joint actually reduced, whereas that locked and fractured facet on the left, excuse me for what I said earlier, for the left was uh, still uh, irreduced. Um, we were able to uh, reduce it, eventually taking down some of that superior articulating facet with a number two kerosene as the whole cartilage was exposed. Um, so we had some difficulty reducing it, but with taking it down a little bit, we were able to further reduce it. And once we had the rods secure on the already reduced side on the right, we were able to compress further on that left side where we were able to uh, get a good reduction in alignment as seen here. And these are the formal post-operative um, images. Um, this gentleman, I mean, the, the remarkable thing is just, although his uh, grip previously was a completely zero out of five, it was two out of five, and this is the next morning after post-operatively. Um, he regained some strength in his wrist flexion extension, his triceps completely recovered. Um, he was having no issues with that left lower extremity, which he did preoperatively. So it was very neat to see. And I think a lot of this could be attributed to um, being in the OR in about six hours from the in, in injury itself. And that's considering also a transfer from an outside hospital. Very nice, Jacob. So uh, one question or comment in the, the chat was about uh, performing uh, perhaps an emergent reduction maneuver in the emergency room. Um, ultimately, what, you know, what I believe and what I teach is, is that What's an emergency here is the reduction, not the surgery and the stabilization. And you can accomplish that uh, without going to surgery, but taking the time to do that uh, often ends up burning about as much time as it would take to just wheel the patient to the OR. And if you do achieve a timely reduction um, in the emergency room, you still, uh, it's still necessary to operate on this patient. You still, you're not really eliminating that reality at all. So I do think that if you're in the right environment and you can conveniently get a reduction done closed in an ICU or even in the ER or, or similar environment, that's perfectly reasonable to proceed with that. But for us in our facility, it's actually just as convenient to just to go straight to the operating room. And um, one risk you take trying to do the closed reduction maneuver is if you never get it, then you have definitely wasted a lot of time and energy uh, for nothing. And you then still have to go to the operating room immediately. But I agree. Uh, I think a lot of places uh, that deal with this particular injury, even more commonly, there, there are trauma centers in the United States that do five of these a night. Uh, and you know, it's nice to have the residents and fellows having people in traction for you and then you're cleaning up the surgical messes starting in the morning. That's beautiful. 
uh, in our, our environment, it, that's really not any better uh, from our perspective. As far as a uh, question about ACDF, uh, the answer to that would be a uh, resounding no. This person does not need an ACDF. Um, of all the literature in the world, uh, probably one of the strongest publications on trauma was by uh, Henry Bowman, uh, did a, a series of 106 bilateral facet dislocations treated with posterior surgery, one level fusion using nothing but 18 gauge wire. Uh, so no screws and rods, no, no nothing. Uh, 105 out of 106 fused and all had a good clinical result, 100% uh, relative to the severity of their injury. So no perceivable benefit from ACDF. Every, every uh, paper I've seen that, that treated the same injury from an anterior only approach, uh, which may not have been your question, you may have been suggesting a 360 fusion, uh, but uh, anterior only is also highly successful in the 90% range, uh, but you're comparing 90% to 99%. And one of the funniest memories I have ever of a cervical spine research society was this exact conversation was had with uh, Paul Anderson as the moderator and the conclusion of the presenter on the ACDF side said, it, well, based on this, it's a reasonable way to treat it. And he responded with my favorite quote, that's the worst conclusion I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> so <laughs> I have PTSD as a result of that conversation. And so I would say, to be fair, doing an ACDF for this injury is not completely absurd. And, and, and certainly if in the surgeon's hands, uh, they feel like that's something they can easily and confidently do. And maybe a posterior operation sounds terribly intimidating and difficult because it's not part of their normal practice perfectly reasonable, but all things uh, being available to you, I would say there's a lot of advantages to doing this as a one level posterior fusion like we did. And we'll go to another uh, fall from a ladder. This time is a 55 year old gentleman um, doing some housework, falling, uh, trimming trees from approximately second story level. Uh, otherwise healthy, <clears throat> EMS on arrival, they placed a chest tube in the patient. He had no motor deficit and he was sensation intact and he had pain in chest while breathing and tenderness along uh, just the entire spinal column. Um, he also had associated a scapular body fracture, multiple, multiple ribs fractured as well. Here on his sagittal cuts of the CT, uh, you can uh, appreciate here, there's a, a T10, a three column injury with a shear component completely through the lamina with a completely collapsed uh, anterior body, as well as a burst fracture at the L1 level with a spinous process fracture at the T12. And approximately at C7, which is better viewed on the next MRI, you can greater appreciate this compression injury um, at the uh, T7 levels. So uh, extensive discussion was kind of had where to, where to begin, where to start. And uh, given that this was a highly unstable fracture of the T10 and being in the center, we were definitely thinking getting good solid fixation at two levels above and below. But the problem with that would be, would just be ending your construct with the next adjacent level being a compression fracture. And here you have a burst fracture, which you could argue you could treat without uh, surgical intervention, although it is a three column injury. It's just something to consider, but you're not gonna stop both of your constructs just at those levels. So the patient was treated with a T6 to an L2 posterior um, instrumentation and fusion with the keys in this procedure also, like Dr. Bellinger mentioned that the rush to the OR, I mean, this patient was taken uh, approximately 12 hours after the injury um, to the operating room before his lungs could uh, fully decompensate. Jacob, that's a pretty straight looking rod. Did you guys not want to build in some sagittal uh, sophistication there? Well, uh, the lordosis that we used was actually all on the bottom. And then we uh, did place it relatively straight uh, as the more cranial that we got. But um, given that it, it was going up to approximately T6, um, we were able to uh, get it at least to neutral position as his uh, alignment. He had about 20 degrees of kyphosis through that T10 segment. So getting it at least to neutral having a good, strong concept above was kind of our number one priority. 
Dr. Ziegler, did you just did you just coin a new term, sagittal sophistication? Or did you just make that up or did you hear that somewhere else? Well, it's a, you know, a non-deformity guy trying to uh, describe <laughs> the situation. All right. So I want any of you guys, if you ever use sagittal sophistication in a talk to reference Dr. Ziegler on May 11th of 2021, because I'd never heard that before. Agreed. And you'll probably never hear it again either. <laughs> All right, any other uh, discussion from anybody? Great job. Yeah, these are great cases, Ted and Raj. Thank you. And thank you, Jacob. You did a nice job with presentation. Thanks, Jacob. All right. Is everybody all finished? I guess we'll hang it up for the evening. Don't forget to claim your credit, 676 to the appropriate number. And uh, see you next time. Thank you. Right. Thank everybody. you, Seattle's fine. Thank you. Seattle's science. Good night, everybody. Take care. Good night. Thanks, guys. We've got some humans still on this call. Are you a human? We have I'm a human. Humans. Yeah, we have some humans here. Yeah, yeah. We, we ought to lend Raj a uh, a copy of the TBI template, maybe. <laughs> <laughs>